Those of you that have the little book by your side there, this we believe, may want to open it and follow with us. First of all, we want to read the statement in the statement of faith itself concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we want to go into the commentary of it and discuss it with you in somewhat more detail. And so we first of all want you to know what Back to the Bible broadcast believes the Bible teaches concerning Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. That is, he is fully divine and is fully human. He pre-existed eternally with the Father, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and was born of a virgin, Mary, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death for the sins of mankind, and we believe that he rose bodily from the grave, that he ascended to heaven, where he is presently the high priest and advocate for his people, and that he will return personally and bodily to this earth again at the close of this age. He is the world's only Savior and is the Lord of all. Now we want to take this up in detail. This statement affirms ten vital truths concerning Jesus Christ. Let's take them up one at a time. First, Jesus is truly and fully divine, as well as truly and fully human, of course, without sin. Although an exact description of the union between uh, the divine and the human nature in uh, one person of Jesus Christ is impossible. We just don't know how to describe that. Something like that's never happened. Uh, because the union is inscrutable. But both aspects of this union must be forcibly and equally affirmed and believed in order that the true biblical revelation may be seen. Philippians, second chapter, verse 5 uh, through 8, we read, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, that is, he sought not his own rights, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of his servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Secondly, Jesus Christ pre-existed eternally with the Father. John 1, uh, 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now he shares the divine trinity. The in the beginning, as we see it in John 1.1, 1, 1, corresponds with the words in the beginning of Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, when God created the heavens and the earth. Same God, but in Trinity. Then thirdly, uh, the manner in which Jesus entered this world was quite unique. Nothing like it. The Virgin Mary gave birth to Jesus without having had maritable relation uh, with Joseph, or as far as that's concerned, any other man. But the agent of her conception was the Holy Spirit. Let me read several passages that qualify this, verify this. Luke 1, where the angel is speaking to Mary, verse 34 and 5. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit which came, will come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And again in Matthew, where the angel, and through a dream, is speaking to Joseph, says, and quoting from the Old Testament, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, uh, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So this is recognized as a supernatural and a very miraculous event. In the fourth place, 
Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.22, who did no sin? Or uh, he did not possess the sinful nature at all, which all men since Adam have possessed. Let's read 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse uh, 21, uh, where he uh, tells us this. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's read that first part again. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He successfully resisted the temptations of the devil. Read Matthew, the fourth chapter on this one. This, of course, in contrast to Adam and Eve, who yielded to similar temptations when the devil came. Read about that in Genesis, the third chapter. Now, Jesus could not have accomplished the task of bearing our sins if he himself had either inherited original sin or if he had committed any personal sin. In the fifth place, Jesus uh, died a substitutionary death for the sins of mankind. The death of Jesus is central in God's great plan to save men. His death was predetermined by the will of God. Peter, in his first sermon at Pentecost, uh, preached uh, these words. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined counsel and the foreknowledge of God. This was all in God's plan. Ye have taken and wicked hands have crucified and slain him. And then it was prefigured in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system. Take, for instance, Hebrews 9, 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This was the divine means of satisfying the just requirements of God's law, which demanded the death penalty for sin. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. So he died in the place uh, and for the benefit of mankind, which is under the sentence of death, so that none need experience eternal separation from God. Take, for instance, uh, he says in 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Or turn to that great chapter in Isaiah, chapter uh, uh, 53 and verses 5 and 6. And he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all, thus says the Scripture. So it was substitutionary in your behalf and my behalf. So we believe that the death of Jesus Christ was for everyone. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6 says, For there is, not, is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, just one who gave himself a ransom for all to be uh, testified in due time, or in 1 John 2, 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Though the benefits of his death are not automatic, they come only to those who make proper response by faith and who will dare to believe God for what he says. For instance, John 3, 16, the verse that we all know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Or as Paul says in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 10, uh, four, or verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, it's offered to all, 
but upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. In the sixth place, Jesus rose again from the grave in bodily form. The physical resurrection of Jesus is affirmed by all four of the gospel writers. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20. Read these chapters. And it was a major theme in the preaching of the apostles. Peter preached it in his first sermon in the Acts, the second chapter. In his second sermon, uh, Acts, the third chapter. Paul preached it when he first came on the scene, the 13th chapter of Acts. And again, he gave a whole chapter to it when he wrote to the Corinthians, the 15th chapter, concerning the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are four things that this does. First, it validates the claims of Jesus to be the Son of God. He claimed he was, and this validated it. Secondly, it assures that God accepted his death as a substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. Thirdly, it provides the basis for a new life uh, God offers to all those that believe in his name. Have you ever wondered what uh, Romans 5.10 means when he says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled uh, to God by the death of his Son. Now, we know that, but much more. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What does he mean? Because he rose again, his life now has become our life. So, in the fourth place, it guarantees the completion of God's redemptive program and the final victory over the last enemy, that is, the enemy known as death. Once again, we could turn to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians if we had the time to read it. In the seventh place, we affirm the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ to heaven and that his present ministry in the presence of God is on the behalf of God's people. Luke records the ascension uh, of this historical fact. Take, for instance, Luke uh, uh, 24, verse 50 and 51. Uh, we read, And he led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And again, Luke in Acts 1, 9 records it. And when he had spoken these words, uh, while they beheld, he was taken up in the clouds and received from them and went out of sight. Well, the writer of the book of Hebrews explains uh, Jesus' present ministry in heaven as being that of intercession in behalf of God's people. Take, for instance, Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore, he is able to save unto the uttermost uh, them that come to God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession uh, for them. Now there, there he represents the believer before God as the high priest and as the advocate, 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And in the eighth place, we affirm the personal and the physical return of Jesus Christ at the close of this age. He was... Uh, this was his promise when he went to heaven and he said uh, uh, to them, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And then again in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18, this has been explicitly given forth. Now the time of his uh, is unknown, the exact time, but we call it imminent which means that uh, he could come any time. And God's people are urged to be awake and watching at all time because his, the return of Christ will begin the final steps of the consummation of God's redemptive program in behalf of his children. In the ninth place, Jesus is the world's only Savior. In the world of con conflicting and competing religions, uh, the Bible declares that there is but one way to find salvation, that is, through Jesus Christ. Other religions and paths of faith represent man's universal search for God. But there is only one path that leads to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life, said Jesus. There is no other way to come to the Father. Or as we read in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given in heaven among men, whereby man must be saved. And finally, and I just have time to mention it, and that in the 10th place, we affirm that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. He has been lifted up by God to this position 
of supreme authority. All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Read Philippians, the second chapter. And for his children, we are to submit to his authority. Thank you for listening to Back to the Bible. Join us again tomorrow as we listen to Theodore M's message. God bless you.